Okay. Hi, everybody. In this video, I'm actually going to go over MLA formatting and show you a sample that I think will help clarify how to cite your sources in your paper. Um, what I'm referring to is just the process of being very transparent where your words stop and where another word, the words of another researcher begins. Um, uh, you may know this as citing your sources. Okay, I found this sample right here at MLA Style Sample, sample uh, MLA Style Center. They have sample essays here. They always pick out a couple each year to kind of highlight. And the one I chose is the one from 2023. And it's right here by Aspen English is the student writer, putting the calm in comics, a communication theory informed reading of graphic narratives. It's real exciting. And you could actually open this yourself, just click on the PDF and take a look at it. They have a lot of other samples, but it's a great, uh, it's a great model for how to separate the author's words or your words and your sources. So as you're reading all these other required peer-reviewed sources, now, what do you do with them? How do you put them together? At first, I wanna go ahead and show you, this is MLA format. So this is the requirement in the class. You'll see they have a heading right here. They have a title, which is, this is actually on one line, but there was not room because the title's so long. So it kind of moves over to the second, which is why the word narratives is by itself. So you'll see too, the upper right-hand side has the last name of the author and the page number. Make no mistake, her last name is English. And so it is English one. It's not the class of English. In fact, the class is special topics in literature. Okay. So when I go straight to that opening, we call that the hook. It's something we've been discussing in great part or lesser part throughout the semester or comp one, um, maybe in high school, you discuss this, but we know this as the hook or the one sentence or phrase or question that will draw our reader into our paper. That is, of course, assuming, you know, I have no choice. If, if I'm your teacher, I have to read your paper. If you are assigned a peer review, they have to read your paper. paper. But in the wider scope, you have to think about always having to, you know, really interest your reader or earn their, their attention. You can't just assume people are going to read your writing. So one way to make readers interested is one, hook them with that opening sentence. Sometimes it's a question. Sometimes it's a statement, strong statement. Sometimes it's data, statistics, something that really catches their eye. Other times it can be a quote from a famous person or from an expert in the field or just a quote that is related. In this paper, our student writer, wrote, the analysis of literature is traditionally reserved for critical theories common in English circles, such as post-structuralism, feminism, or Marxism. So I was reading this or with my class the other night, and um, <laughs> many of the students weren't too impressed or hooked into reading this paper based on the first sentence. Uh, another student of mine who was very passionate about philosophy he was immediately excited. I too am very excited because I, I like literature and all these little places, these sub uh, categories of literature, post-structuralism, feminism, Marxism, excite me. So I am interested in reading more. This is a great example of audience. Who is your audience? But it's okay. If you're not interested, we keep on reading more. At this point, you're probably thinking, what is a critical theory and what are English circles and what is post-structuralism, feminism or Marxism anyway? I mean, why does it matter to me, right? Well, we keep on going, she explains. These approaches serve as lenses with which readers can interpret writing and even in society. Such analyses provide excellent opportunities for learning and deconstruction. But what happens when a piece of literature demands more? Aha. We're starting to transition. What happens when an additional element pic to pictures are mixed through the words we are so familiar with studying? 
So we have here two back-to-back -back questions, okay, which is a wonderful uh, stylistic choice that she made. In recent decades, a growing interest in studying graphic novels as a form of literature has given us the opportunity to find out. Remember what our title was? Something about graphic, yeah, graphic narratives, which are what? Like comics, right? You know, we all know that comics, but we have a formal word, a formal genre. Um, here we have our thesis statement. Due to their relationship with the reader, multimodality and form, comics and graphic novels necessitate a reading practice that considers communication theory as well as critical theory. So this author is asserting that comics and graphic novels should be read in a way that considers communication theory as well as critical theory. Now, you as a reader may not know what communication theory is or what critical theory is, but it doesn't matter. What she is saying is that you will find out if you decide to continue reading this essay not only will the author tell you what communication theory is and critical theory, she's even going to explain that one, comics and graphic novels have a relationship with readers, multimodality, and form. You might not know what a multimodality is or a form, but you will know what a reader is. So you don't need to know everything in that thesis statement when you're reading an essay, nor do you, the author, have to tell your readers everything in your thesis statement? So you will know there are terms that you will understand as, as you finish the essay and basically kind of terms that when you're in the club, you'll know what communication theory is. But the most important thing is that thesis statement should tell your reader what you will be discussing and explaining in the pages that follow. OK, so let's move forward. I want to point out that thesis statement. So right now, the writer has made kind of a promise that that, that last sentence in the introduction, they will be going back and explaining that and, and clarifying all those details. And they will make a committed stance to make sure they touch base on everything. By the end of the paper, you should have a very good understanding of what they are asserting they're going to do in the thesis. But let's go ahead and look at the MLA form in this. Um, so we have a very strong topic sentence. Communication theory is concerned with the transmission of information. There. For all of you are going, what's communication theory? There. Topic sentence, paragraph one, we have details. It is concerned with transmission of information. Now they develop it forward. Of course, all literature is a form of communication. Again, goes forward and forward and further, talking about stories, poems, and essays. Now, here in the blue, because it is a research paper and it is in MLA format, you must bring your expert along. You can't just read the writing and regurgitate the words that you've written, you read about. You need to make sure you bring your experts along and name them. So we have a great example using the signal phrase, according to Stephen Littlejohn and Karen Foss's Encyclopedia of Communication Theory. Again, this is a wonderful example of there is no mistake where this information is going to come from. They are giving the name of two authors and the title of the source. And now we're giving a quotation mark and a quotation mark. That signals that these words come from somewhere else. So we have the statement, virtually every discipline concerned with the human being must study communication to some degree. And guess what? It's on page 102. So if any of you there are out there thinking of writing a paper that maybe has to do with communication theory, and you're reading this paper and thinking, wow, I can use that for that, that article that I want to publish. Where are they getting that information? Well, guess what? She's just told you. It's on page 102 of this journal right here, Encyclopedia of Communication Theory. And guess what? You don't have to look any, for, any further either. It's right here. We have under Little John, Stephen W. and Karen A. Foss. It's right here. 
So you can find out exactly that it comes from Sage Publications. It was published in 2009. So you can go ahead, look it up, grab that information, and put it in your research essay, okay? That's how we we further the, the understanding of knowledge in any genre we're working with in any academic um, field, whether it's science or communication or literature, or philosophy, astrophysics, we have to tag team with the researcher that came before us. And one way we do that is through academic writing. In MLA, which is Modern Language Association, we are using, we're, our, our focus is on English and a little bit of humanities and literature, okay? If you're using APA, you're doing more science-driven or social science-driven topics. But to go further, so those two components must be present when you're bringing your expert. You name them and you give the page number where the information is. Let's move forward here. Okay. Notice here, the next paragraph, we have the writer's words. The exception to this reader response theory, which refuses to ignore the reader's experience of tech. Oh, which re the exception to this is reader response theory, which refuses to ignore the reader's experience of a text. When Louise Rosenblatt a highly influential literary theorist, first formulated the idea in the mid-1900s, she stated, it's very clear that these words come from Louise Rosenblatt. But there's no mistake that it's the authors, okay? Not only that, we have little quotation marks. She's right here. Literature provides a special form of communication. Dot, dot, dot. These dot, dot, dots are called ellipses. And they signify that the author is the, the author of the paper, student, the writer, has taken part the first part of this, like a paragraph or longer excerpt, and she's leaving a bunch of information out. She doesn't want to give us two or three sentences. She doesn't want to give us two or three paragraphs, but it just tells us there's something here. It's saving the place for more writing that we don't we don't have and we don't need right now. Then we have a second part of this quote. We are intimately involved in what we are recreating under the guidance of the text. Again, we have a page number. So if any of you are out here wanting to write about literature and how literature is um, recreating um, the experience of communication and what the text means, you could go to page 305 in the paper written by Louise Rosenblatt, and you can find it right here under Rosenblatt. And you'll see right here, it's 305, but you see it's 304 to 316. So you can go ahead and find that research yourself, okay? Now, I wanted to point out too that once you name, once you name the author the first time, first name, last name, it doesn't matter if they have a doctor or if they have a JD or they're, you know, just give us their name. After you do that, then you can literally call them by their last name throughout the paper. You'll see I put in yellow highlight Louise Rosenblatt. She's actually a very, she is truly a literary theorist. She's very well known in education and literary and philosophical cir circles. Um, well, not philosophical as much, critical theory. So if you look here, Rosenblatt's reader response. So she's going back to Rosenblatt's because she's talking about Rosenblatt's. We don't have Louise Rosenblatt. We don't have Louise. We call her by her last name. In that way, when we write academically, we're all very equal. We all call each other by our last name. After that, we initially introduce the author with their first and last name. In MLA, they are then known by their last name. Rosenblatt's reader response theory, and later on with the help of Rosenblatt's theory, okay? And, but it's always a last name. Understand too, then we always have, if you're going to summarize this, so you're not, you're not going to quote it directly, but you're going to take the words of one of your sources, another article somewhere, and you're going to either summarize or paraphrase it. You're not going to quote them directly. You still have to give them credit for the information. Let's go ahead and look at the first sentence here. Um, in exploring literary devices in graphic novels, Ashley K. 
Dalacqua affirms that Rosenblatt's reader response theory carries into graphic novels due to their unique relationship with the reader, page 368. Now that is information that this writer, okay, that this writer read an article called Exploring Literary Devices in Graphic Novels, and it was written by Ashley K. Dalacqua. And she read that somehow Rosenblatt's theory also applies to graphic novels. Why? Because they have a unique relationship with the reader, because there is a special relationship. So what the writer did is she's not taking Dalacqua's exact words, or she would use quotation marks. See, if you use a quotation mark, you are telling your reader that you are quoting them. They said this in their essay specifically. But because Dalacqua kind of put it in her own words, she is saying this is the information that comes on page 368. So she's basically summarized what she read or maybe paraphrased it, depending on how she took out a whole paragraph or maybe it's just one sentence. But what's important is that information comes from somewhere else, okay? Now we go on, we go further on, we see that we have another name, Scott McLeod confirms this idea. Again, we have a named article in Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art, by stating that with a graphic novel, quote, what you see is seldom what you get if all you are seeing is just ink and paper. In the end, what you get is what you give. And this comes from page 136 and 137. Now, if you were to put that in your words, let's say I was writing this and I am writing, I'm writing an, an article, an essay or an academic article. And I want to talk about, I want to use this, but I want to put it in my words. Well, instead of using a direct quote, I could simply say that, let's say Scott McLeod believes that what you put, what you get out of a reading of, of comic books is what you give to it. It's very, very rare that you only see ink and paper. It's much more. So those words are very different. I use different words than his exact words. What you see is seldom. I did not use what you see is seldom. I actually started with, you know, when you read comics. But it was the same idea, the same general idea, the same information. Well, I got that information from Scott McCloud. So I need to make sure it's very clear my in, it comes from him. So I'd use that in a sentence. Scott McCloud believes, and I would tell my readers it comes from page 136 to 137. If I did not feel like using the author's name in a sentence, then I can put his name or her name, their name, in a citation at the end of the sentence, as in this right here. You'll see at the top of this page here that second to last sentence, social communication presents a set of assumptions that communication behavior has a pattern, that it is learned, context-bound, multimodal, and multifunctional. That whole statement right here, I'll put this in yellow. So this is nice, okay? This was in the writer's words, but that is not something that the writer just knows. They are giving full credit right here to the authors who are Little John and Foss 901. So Little John and Foss, all we know is they are the authors of some source, an article, um, research study, whatever it is, Little John and Foss, page 0901. If we wanted to know more about this, about social communication and assumptions and communication behavior, and it's learned and context bound and multimodal and multifunctional, if we want to know more about that, we can go on page 90, 901 in the source article written by Little John and Foss, and we'll see it here. Little John and Foss. Now notice they didn't put that in the sentence. Had 
had we started the sentence, Little John and Foss explain that social communication present a set of assumptions, then we wouldn't need it in the citation. For example, if I were to type this here, assert that, if let's say where I were to add that in here, if I were to add Little John and Foss assert that social communication presents a set of assumptions, well, then I wouldn't need it in the citation. I could simply just cross it off. And I'll show you how we could do that. I'm just going to go ahead. We would just cross out this and we'd only need 901. I can't quite cross that off. We don't have a strike option here. So, but you see right there, all we need now is 901 because we have the two key components. We have Little John and Foss assert, Little John and Foss, and we have page 901, okay? So the goal is in a paper of this format, when you're writing a research paper in MLA or APA, you should have at least one so of your sources you're, you're referring back to in each paragraph. So in terms of writing, you should have, each paragraph should have at least one expert you're including or one source or one citation, however you look at it. Um, you can look at this sample. You can look at the samples that have been um, available to you in the course. Um, oftentimes there's more than one sample, okay? Anyway, um, more later, and hope this gives you a, a great start and a great direction. Um, again, look for my next video. Otherwise, have a great day. And if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, bye-bye.